All right, let's take our Bibles and open up to 1 Samuel chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. If you'd like to stand, we'll read this passage here and hopefully get a word from the Lord. First Samuel chapter number 8. We'll begin in verse number 1. First Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming to church. We still thank you for the freedom that we are able to enjoy in our country, that we can worship in liberty, and we thank you for that. We don't want to take it lightly. God, we pray that as we assemble and open up the Bible together, that we may set aside the distractions and cares of this life, and we might focus on this portion of Scripture and get a message that you might have for us from this text. Lord, help all of us to listen for your voice and to get something from you. Lord, we need help. We need encouragement. We need rebuke. Lord, we come to church because we do want to hear from you, and we want to hear the preaching of the Bible. And I pray, God, you might speak to us. I'm not worthy to open this book and preach. I am nothing. God, I pray that you just set me aside and just bless the message even in spite of myself. And I pray, God, you might help us. We love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. When you think about the nation of Israel, you understand that Israel, as they begin their nation coming out of Egypt... They do not have a king over them. Moses is referred to as the king of Jeshurun, but it's not in a real political sense of the word. And then when you go through the period of the book of Judges, you understand that they had judges that ruled over them. Do you remember the passage back after Gideon had done all the great exploits with the 300? They all got together and they said, Gideon, we want you to be our king. Rule over us. Gideon said, I won't rule over you, neither will my sons rule over you, but the Lord will rule over you. So during the period of the judges, you had judges that guided the country, but you didn't have a king per se. The danger in that was you had so many uh, interpretations, if you will. You had so much uh, distraction or so much um, confusion. The Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no organization. There was no structure. Like somebody said one time, everything rises and falls on leadership. We do know when we read the period of the kings that the Bible talks about, I think Jehoshaphat, it says he turned the hearts of the people back to God. And that's what Elijah was trying to do when Ahab was king over northern tribes of Israel. He had fire come down from heaven. He said, God, I want you to turn their hearts back. So leadership could influence an entire people just as a head of a household, a father can influence an entire family or maybe a pastor can influence an entire congregation, so on and so forth. So before you had the period of the kings, the Bible here states very frankly here, God states it to Samuel that God was his king. Over in chapter number 12, 
And verse number 12, this is when Samuel is um, going through some of the things of, about how they've rejected the Lord. He said in verse number 12, When ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. Look at this. When the Lord your God was your king. So this is what we call a theocracy. God was their king. And what they're basically doing here, and this is what I want to preach on this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is, they were impeaching God. They were saying, God, we want you to step aside so we can do what we want to do. Lord, we want you to move away so we can move in. We want you to put your rule aside so we can rule. And so the idea is impeaching God. And I want to submit to you that every one of us in our Christian lives, we have to face that struggle and we have to face that temptation because none of us like being told what to do. Amen. We are rebels at heart. And so when you begin to think about this whole thing, I mean, you kids and young people and teenagers, I'm with you. I hate it, you know, that you all, you got to be told what to eat, when to eat, when to get up, when to go to bed, where to go, everything. You know, that's a rough deal, but it's good for you. Because your whole life, somebody's going to tell you what to do. And in your Christian life, you need to learn that God is to tell you what to do. People have a problem with authority and they have a problem with loyalty. And when people have a problem with the authorities in their lives, it's a good clue that they have a problem with God. Amen and amen. I'm not one of these pastor, uh, these Baptist popes, these Nicolaitan uh, popes that go around thinking that I'm the man of God so I have some kind of special thing on me that you don't have. No, man, I'm just like you. I've cleaned the toilets in this church. I wiped down these pews. I'm no better than anybody in here. I don't think that at all. This idea that there's some type of hierarchy. However, I will say this. You are to respect leadership, and you are to follow the authorities God's placed in your wife, in your life. <laughs> I got a funny story about that in a minute. <laughs> I got some amens. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. <laughs> Kicking God out of our lives. Now notice in verses 1 through 5 in 1 Samuel chapter number 8. When you begin to look at the reasons for this happening, notice that there's a concern that comes up. I mean, here's Samuel, and he's been a, a great judge. He's actually the last of the judges and really the first of the prophets. But when you look at Samuel's life, he goes and has a circuit where he preaches and he judges and so forth. But it says here in the text that his sons, in verse number 3, walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre. Now, that's not like licorice. That's like money. <laughs> you know, everybody, don't, we don't use that word. That filthy lucre, that's, that's money. They were taking bribes. So in doing their judgment, they were not just in that. And so they were not of the caliber that Samuel was. And people are like, you know, we're concerned of the leadership that's in our land. Also, you'll notice, you see in the text that they're crying out, and then when you get over to chapter 12 and 11, you realize one of the other things that's pushing toward this is the concern of war because the Ammonites are coming down, bearing down hard on Israel, and the Ammonites are ready to fight. And they have a king, and that king has an army, and Israel is kind of scattered. And so they have these concerns. And if you back up and look at it, there are some legitimate concerns. Here's my point. When we have concerns, oftentimes they are very selfish. And oftentimes when we have concerns in our life, we turn away from dependence on God and we begin to depend on human reasoning. It's a natural process. You say, well, I've been saved all these years. You still have a wicked flesh and that flesh has a tendency to turn back to itself and depend on itself. You know, when you first got saved, some of you can remember, you were so in love with the Lord. You were so in love with the Bible. You were so excited. You literally believed God painted each sunset just so you could enjoy it. You said, man, look what the Lord did for me today. You literally, when you had your food, you really said, man, God, you put this food on my table. You really felt that way and believed that way. But as time wore on and you began to go through things in life, you begin to oftentimes lose that first love. 
And the tendency, especially when we have concerns that come in our life, is to rely on what we can do to get out of the trouble. God won't help anybody that can't help himself. Well, however, oftentimes when you think you're helping yourself, it's the power and grace of God that's helping you help yourself. I can do all things through Christ. You'll notice not just this issue of concern, but the issue of conformity. In verse number 5, Samuel's, Samuel's old and his sons aren't walking in his ways, but notice they say, make us a king to judge us. Look at the last four words. Like all the nations. Now if you remember back when Balaam gave that prophecy in the book of Numbers, remember Balak tried to get Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam... He was trying to get money for it and doing all these things. God still spoke through that man. And he makes a statement in Numbers. And he says that Israel was not to be reckoned among the nations. Now, that's really true today. You look over in the Middle East, if you take a map of the Middle East and you see Israel, they are surrounded by enemies on every side. You have an entire world outside of some of the English-speaking world and Britain, and then the United States, that has been against the nation of Israel. And so that's really their history. But here, they are not supposed to be reckoned among the nations, but they want to be like the nations. It's interesting to me that in the Old Testament, God said, I'm going to call you out, and you're going to be a holy nation. What does that mean? He said, you're going to be a nation of priests. They had to have all of those rituals and all of those sacrifices and all those things that set them aside. Remember those Jews? He told them for the men, he says, look, you don't need to make any, uh, don't, don't, don't uh, uh, block off your beards, don't, don't cut the corner of your hair. They were to have shaggy hair, not necessarily long hair down to your rear end so you think it's a woman when you're walking behind them. But he says, you don't, you don't block your hair off, you don't block your beard off, and you always have to have a beard if you're an Old Testament Jew. And he said he's doing that so they'd be different from all the other nations. And so when you begin to look at them, they had a different diet. They had a different religion, obviously. You had a, a world at that time that worshipped all these other gods. Israel worshipped the one true God. They were said to be a holy nation of priests. Now here's where I'm going that with, the, with, with this for us. Over in Peter's epistles... He preaches to Christians. He says, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You know what he makes reference to in Peter? He says, we are a holy... He quotes that passage. We are a holy nation. God has called us as Christians to be separate from the world, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. But the tendency is to conform to the world. Now look, I understand there are certain things we use. I mean, I'm glad that I use a stove, and I'm glad I'm able to use a toaster, and I'm glad I have a microwave and different things like that. I'm not going to be Amish and say I'm, you know, not conforming, although the Amish have the little bitty uh, bridge and stratton motors on their uh, plows. <laughs> different things like that. Don't let them fool you, man. That's not the idea of conformity. If the idea of conformity that you have is always visible and outward, then you're just going to become another Pharisee. The idea of a conformity has to do with the attitude and the heart that you take toward God. And here in the passage, what they're doing, they're saying, look, we want to be like all the other nations. We don't want to be separate no more. We don't want to be looked upon as strange. We don't want people to know that we're different. People ought to know that you're different. You're a Christian. And you don't have to wear some big signboard and walk around, I'm different. Of course, you know, when you go to a university, what is a university? It's a unity and diversity, right? But they don't celebrate diversity. They, everything's got to be conformed to them. If a professor says, I believe in the creation, he will be blacklisted and he will never become a tenured professor. Go study it out. You're not going to find a tenured professor that's a creationist. They won't allow it because they have no... Diversity. You are supposed to be different. The world's not supposed to like you. I'm not saying you've got to be rude and not take a bath and stuff like that. You know, and, 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 but you should have a bad smell to the world because of your Christian life. 
And whenever you begin to want to conform to the world, that's a danger sign of something way deeper, a bigger problem than just, I want to be like the world. The danger sign is you are actually impeaching God out of your life. That's what's behind this. You're saying, God, I don't care what you say. God, I don't care what your boundaries are. God, I don't care what you have told me to do. I want to be like the world. Conformity. Well, you also see in verse number 7, they say unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice, or the Lord said to Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people. They've not rejected thee, but they've rejected me. Here's the real cause. The real cause is this issue of authority. And I told you I'd tell you a story, and here it is. There were two boys, and they were, they were getting all settled in, uh, like a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And the babysitter was coming over so mom and dad could go off for the night. And uh, they had left, and the babysitter was getting them all settled around the table and so on and so forth. And the babysitter sat in their father's seat. And the older boy says, look, you can't sit there, you know. That's daddy's seat. And the babysitter said, look, your daddy has put me in charge, so for tonight, I'm the boss. The little four-year-old said, well, then you need to sit in mama's seat. <laughs> But like I said in my introductory comments, we all have issues with authority. I mean, who appreciates those speed limit signs? What about those, no, those, those double lines where you can't pass and you drive behind a tractor? Or somebody that thinks you have to farm to feed everybody. I mean, why come we have to eat? <laughs> and you're riding along. and I, I mean, who appreciates the authorities in our life? Impeaching God. Like I said, there's a bigger issue behind this thing. Jesus, he gives some parables along these lines. He sends one parable about the citizens, how they hated the king, and they made the statement in Luke 19, we will not have this man to reign over us. And that is the issue. We don't want God anymore. We want our own king so we can have a say-so. Or so at least we can be behind him or we can have a visible head. The real authority they're rejecting is God. Now, there, there's no reason to impeach the Lord. I mean, think about it. It's amazing to me sometimes how we treat the Lord. The Lord has been nothing but good to us. He's done nothing but love us unconditionally. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, peradventure per per for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us unconditionally. He, he set up boundaries and things, not because He hates us, but because He loves us. And He actually, like the old TV show, Father does know best. He does know better. He, he has a, he's a little smarter than we are. He's called the Ancient of Days. He's been around the block a few times. So when he says, thou shalt not, he's not saying it because he's trying to hold something back good from us. That's Satan's ploy that he used on Eve. He said, look, God doesn't want you to eat this tree because he knows that you'll be as gods. He's trying to oppress you. You know, you're just you're a woman underneath a man, and, and he's trying to keep you back. You need to step up and be a god knowing good and evil. And so that's exactly what happens when temptation comes our way and when the world comes our way, when the pressure comes our way to impeach God in whatever area of your life, the devil comes along and says, well, God, he just don't really know how it was going to be in 2020. God just wasn't really, you know, that Bible's outdated. It's just, you've got to look at it in the historical sense. You really can't believe those things have application for today. That's, that's the devil's voice. And if you're not constantly listening to the voice of God, you're listening to some other voices. That's why you need to be in God's Word, because His Word is His voice. God has done nothing but good for us. All His policies, as far as a king, are just and fair. He doesn't charge a cent for taxes. <laughs> When he tells you and makes the suggestion to give cheerfully, he's not going to strong harm you or strong arm you in it. 
We haven't even been mentioning the offering much. I guess I need to start mentioning that. By the way, the offering plates are outside. Don't forget them when you go out. But see, that's between you and the Lord. He isn't swayed by special interest groups and political expediency and so forth. Now let's look over in chapter 12 here and notice what happens when they impeach God, because they do. God says, okay, and that's an amazing thing you see in the Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament. When people push God away, he will, he will step back. Remember Jesus when he sent his disciples by two by two to go preach, and he says, if they don't receive you, just dust, dust your, your shoes off and go on to the next town. He never forces himself on anybody. So 1 Samuel chapter 12, when Samuel goes through with the results of what's going to take place, pick it up down in verse number 10. Well, actually, come all the way down. He's just kind of given the history of Israel, some different things. Uh, come on down to verse 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. So they're all assembled. And he's telling them about this, this king that they're getting and so forth. They've already gotten Saul. Verse 17, Is not the wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. And Samuel, isn't it amazing the difference God plays, what God calls wicked and what man calls wicked? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You need to call something wicked that God calls wicked instead of saying, oh, it's just okay. No, it ain't okay. This is a wickedness here in them saying, we don't want God anymore. We want a king. This wickedness which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking you a king, verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto us all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and cease and to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Notice when you impeach God, you make certain decisions you cannot reverse. They asked for a king. They got Saul. God said, I gave you Saul in my wrath, <clears throat> one of the minor prophets. Of course, the man after God's own heart was David. And God had picked David. As, you always notice in the Bible, you'll have the first is rejected and then the second comes. Just like the old man and the new man. Saul's rejected. David is blessed. So here they've asked for a king. And now they see that they've sinned because of this storm that's come and so forth. And Samuel's like, well, from this point on, you need to, you need to fly right. But here's the point I want you to see. Certain decisions are forever decisions and they can't be reversed. They've got a king now. Saul will reign for 40 years. If you know anything about Saul's reign, you know how bad it was. Back in chapter number 8, we stopped reading in the text, but he told them how the king was going to be. He said that he's going to have captains over thousands, captains over hundreds. He will reap the harvest, make his instruments of war. Verse 13, he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, to be cooks, to be bakers. He will take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, even the best of them, give them to his, his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed, even of your vineyards, uh, to give to his officers and to his servants. He will take you men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men, your asses, and put them to his work. In other words, he is going to literally just strip you of all your possessions to feed himself, to feed his king. He's going to build up his king kingdom on you. He's going to take advantage of you. 
They're like, we don't care. We want a king. Okay, you want a king? Here you go. When you impeach God in areas of your life, the Lord says, okay, that's what you want. How about it? He says a remarkable statement over the book of Hosea. He says, I will not punish them when they commit whoredom. What does that mean? That means he's going to let them reap the, the, the punishments from it. The wages of sin is death. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. The worst thing that could ever happen to any of us, and I'm taking, I know most of you here, you're saved, you're going to heaven. If you're not saved, the worst thing that can happen to you is you can die without being saved. And if you die without being saved, you go to a place the Bible calls hell. It's a place of weeping, it's awful. You never get out. Place of torment. You have to pay for your sins forever in hell. I don't want that for anybody. God doesn't want that for anybody. But for a Christian in this life, the worst thing that can happen for you is for God to let you have your way. Now, God's a good parent, so there are things that He'll put in, in your life to stop you from having your way. Sometimes he'll have chastisement come through there. Sometimes he'll use the preaching. He'll use the Bible to rebuke you verbally to say, Hey, what are you doing? Are you a knucklehead? <laughs> what are you thinking? Or sometimes it'll be circumstances that will rattle your life to get you to realize, you know what? I didn't even pray about this. You know what? I didn't even put God first. I wanted this, and now I got it. The Lord's like, that's what you wanted. That's what you got. But the worst thing that could happen for us is for God to let us have our way. It's a dangerous place to be at. And that's where Israel is. Over in Deuteronomy, he tells them in prophecy that they are going to get a king, so he goes ahead and gives stipulations. As a matter of fact, the Bible prophesied that they would have a king, and that king eventually would be the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We know that from Genesis 49 and other places. But in Deuteronomy, Moses talks about a king. He says, one day you're going to want to be like all the nations. We know this is coming, but when you do set up a king, number one, he's got to be a Jew. He can't be an outsider. He had to be of the tribes of Israel. And then he says there's some things he's got to do and things he shouldn't do. One of them, he wasn't supposed to multiply silver and gold like Solomon. And he wasn't supposed to multiply horses like Solomon. And he wasn't supposed to send people down into Egypt to get the wares and goods out of Egypt like Solomon. Solomon got in all kind of trouble because Egypt's a bad place. But he makes a statement in Deuteronomy 17. And this is what I like about it, because you know Israel's going to get in trouble. You know, just like us, we do things to get in trouble. He says in Deuteronomy 17, that king, once you get that king, you know what you've got to tell him to do? He needs to take this book, which is at that time the Torah, the five books of Moses, specifically the law, and he says he's, he needs to write him a copy. The king is supposed to sit down with the law and copy it out. Now, we have no record that Saul ever did that. We really have no record that David ever did that. Although David, you can tell from reading the Psalms, he loved God's law. He says it's better than silver and gold. He said it's better than, uh, more to be desired than honey, yea, uh, than the uh, honeycomb. And so we know David loved God's law. I don't know if he wrote the whole thing. I think he wrote portions of it out. But the idea was... There are some decisions you're not going to be able to reverse, some results that are going to happen. But God has a remedy for that, and the remedy is in His Word. You see, they impeach God thinking they're going to get freedom. And that's kind of what the devil does. He holds out the carrot and says, come on, you can eat this carrot because it's very, very... Uh, <laughs> to us, it's nutritious. <laughs> But he holds the carrot out just like it's a piece of cheesecake, amen. Or let's just say he holds a carrot cake out. Yeah, carrot cake's about as good as uh, uh, Italian cream cake, amen. He holds that carrot cake out and he holds whatever that temptation out and he says, here, come, you know, eat and this is going to be good. And he, and he calls it and we think, oh, if I can have this, I will have freedom. Eve is doing a whole lot when she takes of that fruit. You know what she's doing? She's not just taking of the fruit because it's good for the side, look good, and it was going to taste good. She is making a statement. Everybody likes to make statements now, right? 
write it on your shirt, put it on your jersey, whatever the trend is, you know, make a statement. Eve is making a statement, I am my own boss, I am my own God. God told me not to eat of this tree, I don't care what God said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to be liberated. Eve is the first woman's liber. <laughs> She is liberated from old Adam. You know, she was created under his authority, and she don't have to listen to him. I mean, she can listen to another man, right? The devil. He appears as an angel of light, a young man. He's probably a young man. He's like, look, you can talk to me. You don't come over here, honey. You don't have to talk to Adam. And she begins to listen to him instead of her husband, and she says, you know what? I can break free. I can have some freedom. I can enjoy some things that God would not let me enjoy previously. You know what? When I get just a little older, teenagers, I can do some things that mom and dad won't let me do. I can do some things and won't have to hear that crazy preacher breathing and spitting corona all over me telling me I shouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? I'm trying to stay back here. <laughs> I'll have freedom. It'll be so fun to be able to do something that the Bible says not to do, that God says not to do, that mom and dad say not to do, that that old preacher says not to do, it'll be fun, I'll be liberated, I'll be free. No, you won't. Whosoever committed sin, Jesus said, is the servant of it. I won't give you the wicked artist name, but he sung a song saying, you got to serve somebody. You, you 60 hippies, you know who I'm talking about. you got to serve somebody. You're either going to serve God, or you're going to serve the devil. You're either going to serve the Lord, and, listen to this, the authorities the Lord puts in your life, up to a reasonable sense, I'm not telling you, you know, here, Take this Bible and burn it, you know. You can tell me whatever. I'm not going to take a Bible and burn it. We ought to obey God rather than man. But the idea of rebellion and impeaching God is the idea of setting yourself as your own God, as your own authority, and you think you're free, but you're enslaved. You think you are serving yourself, but you're serving the flesh. You think you are liberated, but you are in bondage. You think you don't have a king over you, but you do. Enslaved by this world and the world system. I think it's a bad idea to kick God out of your life. That's a bad idea. That's a bad move. You say, well, preacher, I'm in church. I ain't kicked God out of my life. Okay, let's talk about the individual areas of our life where the Lord might have impressed upon you with the, a verse of Scripture, or maybe just a principle in the Bible. There are some things, you know, if, if you're questioning whether it's right or wrong, you've got a whole lot more problems than just that particular issue that you think may not be answered in the Bible. The Bible lays out a lot of general principles. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Amen and amen. amen. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If it looks bad... It's bad. In everything, give thanks. If you can't thank God for it, and you can't pray about it, and Jesus Christ can't be there around it, you shouldn't be around it. So real simple answers to things. But what happens is we like to play these games, and when you begin to do that, you're not examining your life in an honest manner. When we come to church, it's kind of like going to the doctor, and we want to ask those tough questions. Because we need to get better, not worse. And if you continue to impeach God out of areas of your life, it's okay to have God on Sunday morning just for about an hour maybe, or 34 minutes. But to have God be my God and tell me what I'm supposed to do as far as social media is concerned, or what I'm supposed to do as far as my entertainment is concerned, or what I'm supposed to do as far as my friends are concerned, or what I'm supposed to do as far as my career and my job is concerned, or what I'm supposed to do as far as my money, my money is concerned, or what I'm supposed to do as far as my life. Paul says, what is your life? 
Or James says, what is your life? It is even as a vapor. Paul says, your life is hid in Christ. Your life doesn't belong to you. God has given you this brief period of life. He's entrusted to you as a steward, but he's your king unless you've impeached him. And maybe you haven't impeached him out of all of your life, maybe just little areas. Lord, you can have this room and that room, but I'm going to keep this closet. You ain't going in that one. And I'm going to keep the key to that closet, and you're not welcome in there. You're welcome in all the... You, you can have the Sunday morning room, but you can't have the other Friday night room, Saturday night room. A.T. Pearson, he was one of the uh, consulting editors for C.I. Schofield, a uh, great preacher, great leader in missionary movement. If you study anything about the history of uh, global missions in America, he was very influential in that movement years and years ago. He, made, he, he wrote this. I want to read this to you. Man is like an onion. Layer after layer and each a layer of self in some form. Strip off self-righteousness and you will come to self-trust. Get beneath this and you will come to self-seeking and self-pleasing. Even when we think these are abandoned, self-will betrays its presence. When this is stripped off, we come to self-defense. Just as the Corinthians did the word of the puffed up and last of all, self-glory. When this seems to be abandoned, the heart of the human onion discloses pride that boasts of being truly, truly humble. You just keep peeling back the layer and peeling back. You know what you keep finding? When you keep peeling back yourself, you keep finding self. Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? My problem and your problem is an authority problem. We impeach God out of our life. We want some other king or we want to be king. That's, that's the message. So when you impeach God, you need to realize you are serving somebody whether you like it or not. And the danger in kicking God out of your life is you're inviting all kind of trouble into your life. Now here's the difference between someone that hasn't impeached God and they go through trouble and trials and tribulation and someone who has kicked him out. Somebody who's gotten away from the Lord and they go through trouble and trial just like all of us will. They don't have the peace. They don't have the comfort. They don't have the assurance as they go through that trial and trouble. It may be the trial and trouble is the Lord smacking them around trying to get their attention. It may be that they're fighting against God, kind of like swimming up current. And they're just struggling and struggling and they grow embittered. But somebody that has God as part of their life and God has open doors, policy for every area of their life, whatever you face, you know and you realize, okay, God, you told me I'm doing this according to your will, so if I'm having trouble, then that really belongs to you because you're in charge. Totally two different perspectives. One perspective will drive you crazy, literally. The other perspective will give you peace. Because when God's in control, everything's okay. It's going to be all right. I mean, hey, we're going to have troubles. Bad things are going to happen. But I can know that uh, all things work together for good to them that love God. I know he's got a plan. I might not understand the plan. And I know that one day I'm going to see him. And if I've done what I'm supposed to do at the judgment seat of Christ, it'll go a whole lot better than if I kick him out of areas of my life and try to justify that. It's going to be a bad day of reckoning when we get to the judgment. We're going to have a word of prayer. Have just a brief invitation time. If there's something in your life where you've been saying no to the Lord or an issue or an area in your life you've... you've Maybe not verbally said, get out of my life, God, but maybe if that's how you feel, why don't you repent of that this morning? And just say, Lord, I don't want to impeach you out of my life. I'm too self-willed, Lord. I'm too strong, Lord. Forgive me. Should you just be honest with the Lord this morning?